Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Please give a thumbs up or something. Can you hear me? Hello. Okay, thank you. Sounds good. All right. Well, good morning for me and good evening for you. Uh, it is morning in Toronto, Canada right now. <clears throat> Just trying to wake up, so it'll be a little bit slow, but we'll get through everything together. Thanks for registering for the workshop series. Um, and the next, uh, in the next, we have four workshop, uh, four workshops waiting for you. Uh, today's workshop is is very interesting and unique, um, because it's it's meant to help you find a gap. But we have a lot of interesting sort of workshops being developed, including the ones that you register, as well as other ones that we've been thinking about involving statistics and analysis. So stay tuned about that, and if, if those workshops are of interest to you, then of course I would recommend and encourage everyone to register. Uh, but just a quick uh, sort of plug here. Uh, so I work with, I work at Methodologists, um, where essentially we have lots of different products, but uh, we're really very much focused on helping organizations design people-centered services through rigorous research and meaningful engagement. Um, but part of that is also building capacity for really effective and meaningful research. Um, I myself have engaged in with many, many organizations, uh, not so much in Pakistan, but Canada and the United States, excuse me, in some European countries um, to really help them to understand what kind of research methodologies exist and how they can use different research methodologies to address their research questions or their policy needs or their intervention needs. Um, and, and really building effective and meaningful curriculum to help uh, their, them and their teams uh, do effective and meaningful research. But we also have other sort of uh, products. We have a newsletter, Equus in Health, where we talk about health system issues. We have a YouTube channel called Healthcare Humanized, where we talk about the other aspects of health that most people usually don't talk about. So, so that's just that's just a little bit of a plug. Of, you know, I would encourage everyone to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as follow our newsletter as well. Um, and I'll just uh, sort of providing an inkling to the workshop series that you all registered for. We have four workshops uh, remaining in this big series. The first one you have, may have went to, which was a free open to everyone. The remaining are a bit more, uh, they're a bit more deeper, a bit more applied with sort of tested strategies that have worked for myself and others who have sort of informed the development of this workshop series. Today's focus for the next hour and a half-ish is try to understand how to develop an idea um, and convert it into a research question that you can further pursue in terms of a research study and then publish. Um, but we have three other workshops um, and next week on Monday. Uh, I think most of you may be registered. Um, that's about really providing you with a language to talk about study designs, methodology. And the unique aspect of this is, um, especially for the Pakistan context, um, a lot of the education that most uh, medical students probably receive are very much focused on sort of meta-analyses. I think that has been the biggest, biggest meta-analyses, statistics, quantitative sort of analyses. But next week's workshops, we're going to provide a broader view of different types of methodologies in study design. And I think that's a that's that's really important because it'll equip you with better language than everyone around you when it comes to talking about research. Um, and also help you to see problems and ideas in, in a different way, um, in a more holistic and comprehensive way. But we also have, later in July, we have a workshop on scientific writing and publication strategy. That's where we get really deep into how do we publish, how do we get our articles published? How have we done that in the past? 
I want to have multiple resources and multiple strategies from peer review, how to respond to peer review comments, for example, how to find journals. Um, and, and we're really excited to get in, into all of that. Um, and then finally, in July, on July 24th, we'll have uh, one very applied one for those interested in enhancing your academic CV for residency in the States or, you know, other countries and beyond. And we'll have uh, sort of people uh, at that meeting who have experience or at different stages of that process. <clears throat> So today, uh, so today we really have three outcomes. Um, the first one is to talk about literature reviews. And I know you probably know what literature reviews are. You probably have done them. I'm going to give you a short crash course on literature reviews that I have given to so many people and often they are unfamiliar with what I'm talking about. Um, and the purpose of this crash course is to give you that uh, raw perspective of different types of literature reviews, different purposes of literature reviews and different ways to use literature reviews. It's a lot more complicated than you think. It's not just about writing it for a background section or writing a systematic review. There's a little bit more nuance to it. And I think equipping yourself with that nuance is essential as you become better and more meaningful researchers. But we'll also talk about research questions. And of course, you're familiar with PICO, but we'll also talk about other frameworks like FINER. Uh, PICO is everywhere in quantitative research, and we'll use that to apply uh, to a couple of examples. Um, but we'll also use FINER to, uh, to really fill in the gaps of PICO with regarding the larger implications of the study, the meaning of the study, the relevance of the study. Um, and then we'll, 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 at the very end, we'll do a little bit of an exercise to really help you uh, spend some time to identify some gaps that are interesting to you and start to, start to maybe not fully, and we, maybe we can support afterwards as well, start to frame some questions for a review of SOAR or a study that are meaningful to you. And we'll have like a little bit of exchange to talk about those questions. So let's get into the literature review. And the first thing I wanted to do here is really uh, <clears throat> get some definitions out of the way because whenever you search literature review um, on Google, you'll get all kinds of definitions, um, all kinds of slight differences, even though all these definitions are talking about roughly the same thing. Um, they're slightly different. You know, Wikipedia said it's an overview of published works. Um, they say it's a general image of the existing knowledge on the topic under question. Um, uh, the University of Toronto, where I'm located, uh, literature review is an account of what has been published. Uh, by scholars and researchers. Um, and then Washington University in St. Louis says uh, it discusses and analyzes published information. So this is more about analysis, critical thinking around articles in a particular subject area. Um, but it's more than just a summary. Um, there's also, you know, developing understanding an organizational pattern that combines both a summary and a synthesis. Um, so there's written, like different elements of literature review exist depending upon your purpose, and that, that's the main point here. We're going to talk about a few different types, definitely not all the types, um, but we'll provide you resources if you're interested in knowing the entire typology of reviews and literature reviews. Um, but depending upon the type, there's different emphasis on different elements of it. Some may be a bit more superficial, just want like a little bit of understanding of what the topics and the studies and where they have been published. Others may be a bit more deeper, looking in reading between the lines of the findings, looking at the limitations in the discussion and understanding what implications they have on your work as well as the literature. But I'm going to provide a couple of definitions that I've sort of made up over the years um, uh, and, of course, informed by lots of readings and lots of talking to people. But these definitions are meant to serve as teaching purposes because I can give you 10 definitions and they'll slightly be different, but they won't really hone in some of the most important points that I think are relevant to understand literature views. So this, this ha slide has that. So literature views can be systematic and can be non-systematic. There's two types of them. Um, what do I mean by systematic and non-systematic? Let's talk about non-systematic. So they usually non-systematic literature reviews are usually conducted to understand a 
the research area better and to do more research. So they're not a publication in itself. They're not a systematic review. They're sort of like, I want to, I have, I'm doing this research study on the mental health of healthcare workers, for example. I want to understand what do we know about the mental health of healthcare workers. I'm going to go through a couple of journals that have published on this topic, a couple of databases. I'm just going to get maybe 10, 15 articles. I'm going to review them. I'm going to analyze them. I'm going to write a literature review. That's what a non-systematic literature review is because you're sort of using what it, what's referred to as a berry picking approach. You're picking berries here and here to suit your particular purpose, which is to write a background uh, for write a background or understand a research area better for a, a study that you're doing. But if you want to do a literature review for the sake of doing a literature review and for the sake of publishing a literature review, that's what's referred to what a, a series of systematic literature reviews. And these, these, of course, are, you know, like I said, they're, they're conducted to be published, um, uh, but as well as to understand a research area better. But they're also conducted in a way that's much more comprehensive, hence the name systematic literature review. There is a series of steps, usually, um, for those who know what a meta-analysis is, um, meta-analysis, it has a very rigid series of steps, um, checking heterogeneity of the studies, checking confounders, et cetera, doing the meta-aggregation analyses um, that you wouldn't necessarily do in a non-systematic literature review, but because you want to publish a systematic review, you want it to better inform the literature, you want it to be cited by others in the field, you do all these series of steps, and we'll talk about that right in the next slide. Um, and don't worry, we'll have um, <clears throat> we'll have a moment after I get through some of the I think five or six more slides where we'll take a short break and you can ask any questions about literature reviews. Um, so this is another series of steps that I have developed. Um, I you'll find all kinds of steps in research articles about literature reviews. Um, but these series of steps, the way they're why they're important is because I have tested them, I have used them, and. 50 or more reviews that I've published. Um, and they work really well. Um, uh, and, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about each one of them in turn and then talk about a couple of examples of literature reviews, some of which you may be familiar with. So the first is scope, right? And what do I mean by scope? Scope is identifying from the vast amount of literature that's relevant to your topic, like, for example, antibiotics. What part of antibiotics are you interested in? Um, so the way you do this is you go through databases, and databases, I mean things like Google Scholar is technically a database as well, but things like PubMed, things like Cochrane, which has randomized controlled trials, things like Medline, which is health and social and biological sort of articles. Um, <clears throat> so you go through these databases, you type in a couple of relevant terms, you know, what you call search terms, like for example, antibiotics. And then usually these databases give you a bunch of terms uh, that are aligned with the language that the database use. So it could be, like they have a bunch of articles related to a term called antibiotics, or maybe even under antibiotics and maybe like antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. um, you, take, you take a look at all those search terms and you try to identify the ones that are most interesting or the most relevant to your research questions. Um, and you do this over time as you develop more and more, um, sorry, as you uh, uh, identify search terms that are relevant to your research questions, you start to sort of build a longer search strategy of all the terms that are relevant. Um, you look at the search results of each of those terms. Are some of them relevant? Are some of them not relevant? You may find articles that you've never read before, but are very, very relevant to your research question. Uh, you can use those to further develop your search strategy. Um, and, and over time, you build a search strategy that then you sort of uh, consider as a robust search strategy they use in the second step of searching. Now, <clears throat> developing a search strategy is out of scope here. I would spend probably eight hours just talking about developing search strategies. There's entire master's programs that people do. Um, I'm not sure if there's any available in Pakistan, but there's entire master programs that are definitely in the United States and Canada that people do just 
for information science. And one part of it is using these databases in a way that's effective and meaningful. So of course I can provide a crash course on this, but definitely out of the scope here. Um, but depending on the methodology, you might need to search different data sources. You might need to search with different terms. So for example, if you're interested in qualitative research, which we'll talk about in a couple of slides, um, then you then the type of databases that you search might look differently than if you were interested in randomized control trials. Just quickly, if I wanted to search for randomized control trials, I would search Cochrane's database of randomized control trials because that is a database of randomized control trials. Um, but I wouldn't search that in a qualitative review because I'm not interested in randomized control trials, right? So there's a there, there's a little bit of difference that you go in uh, in terms of what methodology and what's the uh, what are the different legibility criteria that you're using. Another example is is it a rapid review, right? Rapid reviews are generally um, there have been more and more published in recent years, but they're sort of non systematic literature reviews that are done sort of systematically in some ways. Um, and they are published in so, for 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 like just rapid decision making um, to help a government. So, for example, lots of rapid reviews are published uh, in 2020 and 2021 to help governments understand COVID nineteen pandemic and its impact uh, on people. And I and I <clears throat> sort of worked with many organizations to develop rapid reviews and regular reviews for that purpose as well. But if you're doing a rapid review, uh, you may consider doing a limited search results just to look at the past three years. So articles on antibiotic resistance, but just for the past three years, not for the past 100 years or 50 years or whatever. Um, so, And then that would also be something that you need to consider in your search strategy. But also keep in mind that depending upon your research questions, you may need to look for both academic articles, right? Like research studies, randomized control trials, um, from databases, but you might also be interested in policy or organizational documents, right? So I'm like doing a, I'm doing a policy analysis on government run, not for profit and for profit plasma fractionation facilities around the world. I, I have found some academic articles, but I'm really interested in what these organize, what policies these organizations have. So they may have policy documents. So we're going to be developing a comprehensive list of organizations around the world. Uh, that do fractionation of plasma. Um, and, and based on that, we're going to search each website, each organization website, and extract those documents. Uh, so that can be through Google, right? Or it could be through other, you know, we're recently also using AI and other tools to identify organizations and policy documents. That's a lot about scope. But these are just examples for you to understand. The scope is to help you to narrow down what strategy you're going to develop for your research questions. Once you have that narrowed down, there, there's a whole series of, uh, I mean, like, like I said earlier, there's a whole series of workshops you can do about actually searching and using databases. And I, of course I can show you, I will, but I'll not go through the details right now because it's a very, very long process. Uh, but once you have scoped the literature, you develop a search strategy, which has specific language and formatting and you input into databases and it really just outputs outputs uh, a number of studies that that it identified based on your search terms. Um, that goes hand in hand with the third stage, which is really about screening. So once you have the list of articles, uh, screening involves reviewing the titles and abstracts and the full text in two different stages. Um, but the purpose of these two stages and screening is to decide whether or not that particular study you're taking a look at is included and are relevant to your literature review questions, to your eligibility criteria. Um, so there's two stages of screening, the screening that I said. So the first stage is looking at the titles and abstracts, that's screening level one. Um, and if you're just looking at the title and abstract, it's pretty straightforward if you have a thousand or 2,000 or 3,000 uh, titles and abstracts to take a look at. Um, at this stage, at least two people, usually it's done within a team, uh, especially if it's a systematic review, at least two people look at each article and any disagreement is usually resolved by a third person. So if one person for one article said yes, another person said no, then a third person comes in and decides whether it's yes or no. And that way you have uh, at least two eyes on each article, um, but a third eye if there's disagreements. Um, but screening can be done individually as well. Again, you know, remember, I told you, it depends on your purpose. If it's a non-systematic literature review to help you inform, to inform a background or just better understand a research area because you're doing a study, you don't have to, you don't have to do screening in groups, 
right? You can do screening individually, right? <laughs> like it's not, in those instances, the screening is not meant to be comprehensive and therefore you don't need the one, two, three people to ensure that you get all the screening results that are relevant. But as you can see that once you go through the screening process, let's say you have a thousand titles and abstracts, you go through that, you get 50 full text, you review the 50 full text as well, then you're left with maybe 15, 20 ish studies, which is usually we're usually the case or has been the case for very focused research questions. You have a, a list of included articles. Now what's next? What's next is you don't immediately get into the data extraction or sorry, the data synthesis and start writing. There's, there's a series of steps that I have used that have really helped us save time and really helped us understand literatures in a way that people, even experts, usually don't understand. Um, I have worked with so many professors, you'd be surprised, uh, in, in, in the States, and they have lots of publications, but they're always all over the place. Um, and whatever they do publish tends to be very surface level. Um, so these series of steps I tell you is that, you know, in, in the end, when we do research, we want to do research that is not only published, of course, where you know we want to improve our research portfolio, but also somewhat meaningful. And someone would actually gain some knowledge from understanding our literature reviews. Um, so the first step is what I call data extraction, right? And I define data extraction a little bit separately from others. Um, data extraction, usually you might hear from others, is just extracting everything from the article, extracting not just the basic characteristics, but also the findings, also other you know relevant information. A data extraction in this case, um, I'm referring to extracting study and methodological characteristics. So from those 15 studies, what are the study and methodological characteristics? What is Who are the authors? When were they published? What years? What were the study design? Who were the participants? And so forth. I usually extract, uh, so if I have 15 studies, I extract for each study um, across a series of columns, author, year, publication, title, research objective, et cetera, um, in an Excel document. The reason why I do an Excel document is because, as you can imagine, um, if you have 50 studies or 15 studies, when you populate an Excel document, you'll be clearly able to tell gaps in your literature. So you have 15 studies and all of them are published in 2020. You'll be able to tell from the Excel document that, oh yeah, all the studies are published in 2020. And then the question becomes, what happened in 2020, right? Or you might you might see that all the studies that you found were a particular a cross-sectional design. Um, and cross-sectional designs, cross-sectional surveys have limitations in itself. So maybe that's an implication for your research literature. Maybe one thing that you need to work on is, you know, maybe there needs to be more observational, a longitudinal design, or maybe there needs to be a randomized controlled trial on your topic if it's possible. So that's why I do. I do it in an Excel document and extract the study and methodological characteristics. We do this to understand the literature better. We do this to answer specific questions like are they, are most articles from a particular year or they use a specific design and answering these questions can lead you to gaps that you can identify and explain and rationalize in as the core of your research study. Oftentimes <clears throat> before big, big projects, uh, 200k projects, 1 million projects, um, this is done. A review is done and usually it's a systematic review. Why it's done is because for the funding proposals, you need some you need some evidence, right? You need to know, you need to show the people that are reviewing the funding proposals that you know what you're talking about. So oftentimes people do literature reviews and I'm doing several literature reviews right now to be able to ask for funding uh, next year. Um, so literature reviews help you in this way, the data extraction help you identify the gaps and give you the language to talk about why you want to do a particular research study and why you, you need the money to do that study. But once you have that literature review, the other purpose of that is to also focus in on how you're gonna look at the rest of the articles, right? Because at this point, you really only looked at maybe the abstract title, maybe a little bit of the background and mostly the methods to get at those uh, uh, study methodological characteristics. Now it's about the findings and the discussion. And of course that is very rich with data as well. Um, I usually start with abstract first because the abstract has usually a finding section and I'll show a couple of abstracts in the coming slides. Um, uh, if, if you're tight on time, 
if you're not doing a systematic review, um, if you just want to understand the literature very quickly, for example, um, what I've done in the past is extracted the one or two or three lines of the results and the discussion sections of abstracts of all the articles that are included, like the 15 or so articles, and we've done a thematic analysis on them. The rationale for that is the most important findings of that literature review are going to be in abstract. If they're not in the abstract, probably not core to the arguments that are presented by the authors in that literature review. So if you can just imagine, I'm looking at 15 articles, taking that four lines for each article, putting in a Word document. Now I have 15 sort of rows or 15 articles with 15 sort of um, uh, 15 sort of sections of the results of the discussion. I review all of them and I perform some sort of a thematic a a analysis. And what I mean by that is, are there any commonalities between them? Are similar themes emerging between the articles? Are similar sub-themes and arguments emerging? Are there questions that <clears throat> are the questions that I have that are unanswered by this included list? That's a very, very important point, right? If you ask a question and none of the articles answer, that might be a good area for further research. But of course, if you need if if you need more information, sometimes articles are not very descriptive in the abstract. Um, then you know, feel free to go into the full literature. Uh, for a full article. Uh, feel free to, for example, if you see the theme, if you need more information about a theme that's mentioned in the abstract, try to find the, that section within the article and read it. Because the, just go based on what you think uh, you need based on your information needs. Um, and of course, if you need specific information from the articles, like what are the gaps that this literature is identified? What are the future directions? I need gaps and future directions to frame my research study to frame my article that I'm writing, then the, I would recommend reading the full discussion section because the discussion section usually has um, both a summary of what they found. And oftentimes the discussion section summary of the article is much better than the abstract in my, in my experience, uh, but also reading sort of their interpretation of the findings, which usually ends with what they did, what they should have done, what they could have done, what should be done in the future. And that can be very helpful to identify again. That can be helpful to identify an idea and identify a gap, which can in of itself become research studies. Um, and then as you do this thematic analysis, you'll start to better understand what type of literature you're looking at. Um, and of course, data synthesis, again, we can have at least one full workshop to go through a series of steps on how to really synthesize data, um, qualitative data, quantitative data. Um, and we'll look to have that in the future sometime. Um, but this is just meant to give you a little bit of inkling of the steps of the literature review. Um, but the last step is really writing, right? Um, and I know there's a big jump between data synthesis and writing, which we can explore at another time. Uh, but the next step is writing. And writing, even though I've considered it a different step, it's part of data synthesis. And I want you to, I want you to remember that writing is not writing, it is data synthesis. Because if you imagine, if you have a list of themes, a list of ideas that you want to write, like an outline, when you actually start writing them, you start to make connections. You start to make connections that you didn't see before. And because that happens, uh, I would consider writing as part of data synthesis. You combine everything you've learned about your including studies into a written form. And you write it in a way that is meaningful and relevant to the audience, to researchers, to other clinicians, to policymakers. Uh, but writing includes, in this case, think of it as a description of the studies um, that you included. So a summary of the data extraction, how many studies were published in this year, how many studies were published in, um, how many studies were published in a particular country, <clears throat> and as well as the findings of your thematic analysis. I know lots, lots of interesting things. We'll have a short break in a couple of slides, but I really wanted to hone in on some examples of literature reviews. So we'll go through a couple of them. So first example, one which all of you are probably very familiar with is a meta-analysis. And I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this. Of course, I can spend more time on this if you have other questions. Um, 
But a meta-analysis in a very simple form, it's really about aggregating similar outcomes of multiple studies across multiple contexts to provide a determination of the overall efficacy of a treatment drug or therapy. So think of it this way, that within a particular randomized controlled trials, you're recruiting multiple participants who may come from different walks of life. You're giving them the same surveys or tests uh, to get a standardized set of data that you then do analysis on. Now, a meta-analysis is taking multiple studies like those I've done in different countries and different contexts and different settings and looking at all those as long as they're similar enough in terms of the data, putting them in one database and analyzing that. The advantage of meta-analysis, as long as it's you know relatively similar data, is sample size. The higher the sample size gets, the better the statistics get, the more confident you are in the ability of that meta-analysis to make conclusions. So comparing a one randomized control trial on the effective efficacy of a drug compared to a meta-analysis on 10 randomized control trials on the efficacy of that same drug. Of course, the second one would provide a lot more value, right? Um, as long as the randomized control trials in that meta-analysis are similar enough. Um, and there's a whole like, uh, I know there's lots of organizations in Pakistan that provide workshops on meta-analysis. There's a whole like series of steps and uh, to really determine the different aspects of whether meta-analysis is even possible. Um, but that's the main difference. Um, but there's other types of reviews um, that you may or may not be familiar with that are also very much published. So another type of review that's very common, especially since the pandemic, is called the scoping review. Right. If you remember scope, scoping, that was the first step that we identified in steps of a literature review. A scoping review is really intended to be comprehensive, to understand the size and the scope of the literature. Right. The purpose of the scope of a scoping review is to look at the literature, the characteristics, the study and methodological characteristics, the findings in some cases to identify gaps. That's the purpose. So the meta-analysis was to identify whether a treatment is effective or not. The scoping review is to understand a, an area like antibiotic resistance and to just describe the area. What has been published? What should be published? And what are unanswered questions? That's the purpose of scoping review. Sometimes it's to use to clarify key concepts, right? Sometimes a literature, so much has been published in a literature and it's all over the place, right? When you talk to an expert, they may say something. When you talk to another expert, they may say something else. A scoping review can help to bring everything together into one article to give you the foundation of what that literature is talking about. And that exercise can also be helpful to identify key gaps and next steps. So example here is the scoping review that uh, I published with a team in 2020. Um, and this was a scoping review of 149 studies from around the world, really looking at the relationship between knowledge misconceptions, risk obsession, and behavior during pandemics. Um, so this wasn't, the data included here wasn't about um, uh, COVID-19 pandemic because of course in 2020, there wasn't much about the COVID-19 pandemic at that time. What we did was we looked at outbreaks, global outbreaks and pandemics uh, for like example, H1N1, um, uh, small, uh, not smallpox, uh, SARS, for example, that happened 2003, 2004. Um, we looked at studies from those comparable in uh, comparable instances um, that were re relevant to how people gain knowledge about the pandemic, where they access knowledge, uh, what changes their behavior, uh, to really give a picture of uh, how people have reacted over the past 20 ish years and what facilitators, barrier strategies governments can use to to really align people's behaviors and attitudes mm -hmm. toward the policies that they were uh, they, they wanted to develop, like the physical distancing policies and lockdowns and things like that. So this scoping review was 149 studies, a very, very big feat, very comprehensive for that time. Of course, a lot had been published on COVID-19 since then. So it's it's uh, it's it's not no longer comprehensive in that sense. Um, but it gave that view of what do we know about this literature, what questions have been asked, what questions haven't been asked, and what can we, how can we use this data to inform ongoing policy? That's what the, what the scoping review was. 
Um, in terms of the qualitative evidence synthesis, uh, this is the next one, and I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to be a little bit speedier here. Um, so a qualitative evidence synthesis is what you is how it sounds. It's an evidence synthesis, a literature review for uh, qualitative research. Qualitative research uses open-ended questions. It can use a survey, but generally interviews and focus groups and observation. Um, and the qualitative evidence synthesis really hones in uh, and tries to analyze people's experiences, patients' experiences, families' experiences, providers' experiences to provide a more holistic image of people's experiences across multiple contexts. So it's really what we call an interpretive review of qualitative studies. The purpose is uh, is not just to summarize past qualitative studies that uh, that could be done that could be done in the context of a scoping review where you summarize past research studies, what questions have been asked and not asked, but it's also to interpret and read between the lines uh, in, in a way that provides deeper insights and understanding about the subject being studied. Um, so think of it as, you know, for example, this one. This was published with Mobin, uh, and it was a qualitative evidence synthesis on the factors that promote vaccine hesitancy, rejection, and delay in parents. This was done right before the pandemic. Um, and the goal of this was to look at the qualitative studies, which would tend to be very qualitative, look at all the reasons and rationales and explanations and examples that parents gave in those studies for why they chose not to vaccinate their child for MMR or other you know, childhood vaccines. And to combine all of this data into one summary of what are the reasons and rationales for why parents reject or delay uh, vac uh, uh, vaccination for their children. So you can see that survey doing a quantitative uh, systematic review of service can also answer these research questions. But if you take a look at this article, I'm happy to send it afterwards, you'll see that uh, a qualitative review went really, really deep uh, in a way that any other quantitative systematic review could. It really provided an explanation, a rationale. It really provided a full uh, interpretation of why parents may uh, make a certain decision. And that gave the foundation for policymakers to uh, better understand what strategies they might use and, and how those strategies might actually land. Um, on parents, will they actually be willing to engage in, uh, you know, a conversation or dialogue or public health campaigns? Um, but more and more on that in the article, of course, I'm happy to send it afterwards. Okay, um, I've talked a lot. I'm going to give, before I get into how to find a gap, this uh, resource that we have developed, I'm going to give five minutes um, quickly to everyone to just take a quick break. And of course, in that five minutes, you can also ask me any questions you have. You can ask me any questions in the chat, or you can, uh, you know, open your mic and ask me. Um, so we'll come back at 1040, uh, 1048.
for those who have who are here, are there any quick questions um that you want to ask about what's been said about literature reviews? Um any questions I can answer before we go into research questions and activity. Okay, let's get back at let's get back into it. Um, I'm gonna quickly talk about this resource that uh, we developed at TMT. Um, I'm I will happy to share this resource after this workshop is done. But this resource is really intended to provide you with a bit of guidance on finding a gap on um, some of the things that we've already discussed, but a bit more practical in the sense of what steps do you follow. Um, and, and we'll be using some of these steps in the activity later in, in this workshop at the very end when, when you all do it individually. Um, so there's really seven steps, identify the discipline broadly, right? Uh, and I'm talking about like, you know, for example, public health, immunology, right? Are, uh, these are the disciplines, but then after you've identified that, and that may be relevant to your specialty or or maybe maybe uh, you know you're a you want to become an immunologist or something, or you want to specialize in that. So that would be your discipline. Um, and as experts in those disciplines, you probably have some idea um, at the conversations or reading a couple of studies of the major issues in that discipline, right? So public health could be vaccine hesitancy. Vaccine hesitancy around the world has been climbing rapidly, especially with childhood vaccines. That's a specific issue within the broader topic of public health, right? So identify the discipline, the broader, uh, and then identify the, and specify the issues that you know of um, and that you're interested in uh, further refining to a gap and a research question. Uh, and then the first step is really to look at reviews and you can easily find reviews and, and most reviews would be open access and freely available as well. How do you find reviews? Once you identify the issue, vaccine hesitancy, writing Google Scholar, vaccine hesitancy, review. Uh, click on the side since 2020, for example, or whatever year, usually five years from whenever you're searching, you'll find reviews. Uh, most likely you'll find a review on the particular topic. Um, if you don't find one, then of course, broaden your search, change the terms. Um, but the idea of the third step is to take a look at at least three reviews um, to get a better understanding of that particular issue and what's being said about the issue. Review the background to understand the topic um, and the context. Review the findings to understand the actual literature, what questions have been asked and answered. Review the discussion of those literature reviews, including the limitations to understand gaps in future directions identified by the authors. And start to list unanswered questions as you read each article. So, and a, and a quick note-taking method that I've uh, put as a note for myself that I wanted to highlight, and, and of course, the practical stuff we can, of course, talk about. Um, so highlighting uh, what I do in terms of note-taking uh, literature reviews if, in the context of finding gap, I highlight key concepts and their definitions, right? So vaccine hesitancy, there's a definition by WHO. I highlight the word vaccine hesitancy and I highlight the exact definition. Um, I highlight any findings that make me pause for a second, right? And like I read it and I'm like, hmm, either I don't get it or I find it very, very interesting. Um, I highlight those and I highlight ones that I read multiple times and I still don't understand. That's the note-taking method that I usually use um, to better understand the reviews, what's being said and better understand you know, what the literature is saying uh, as I look at multiple reviews. Um, but then the next step is look at to look at three primary studies and those can easily be identified not through a separate search on Google Scholar, but through the reviews that you found. 
right? They usually, there's a reference list. Maybe if it's like a systematic review of sort, they usually have, like these are the included studies. They may have a table of those included studies. Identify those primary studies, get their full PDFs, and use that as to further understand the literature. And the reason why this step is here is because reviews are aggregated, right? They look at 20 articles and they sort of provide you with an aggregated overview of that particular topic. Um, looking at articles will provide you with more nuance and depth. So if you read a review and you're like, I really wanna know about this specific aspect of uh, this literature, find that article, for example, in a section of a review, you're like, I wanna know about, I don't know, uh, natural living and its association with vaccine hesitancy. A lot of people are like, everything has to be organic, natural. Is that philosophy associated with people more likely to reject and delay vaccines? I wanna know more about that, right? Because this summary in the literature is not enough. In that summary, on the literature, you'll find articles that are cited by the authors. Get those articles, review those articles to better understand what natural organic living is in this context and how it might or may or may not be associated with rejection and delay of vaccines. That's the real purpose. Really be guided by your interests um, to further deepen your knowledge about the topic. Um, but then the last few steps is sort of uh, continue reading, of course. I mean, the, the, the three reviews and the articles in those reviews may not be enough. Right. When what I recommend is what it's referred to as a snowball or a berry picking method. So primary studies from the literature reviews that you retrieved, they may have articles cited, read those articles and essentially do a berry picking method based on your interests and your gaps. If you understand a particular topic or concept really well, you don't necessarily need to read more on that topic. Try to read things that are interesting to you, things that are big issues based on your experience and your practice, mm -hmm. um, and, and things that are confusing because often those things are the ones that become gaps in research questions. And the last two steps is to create that literature review log and to analyze. And this is very similar to the data extraction that we talked about right? A citation log of all the articles across the countries, the years of publication. And that is very helpful because it helps you to identify specific gaps. And I'm not going to go back into that, but, but the purpose of that is to have everything in one place and to visualize it using, I don't know, pie charts, bar charts, depending upon it, right? Um, are participants mostly physicians in the context of a particular study? Should nurses also be studied? Maybe that's a study in and of itself if there's no studies on nurses, right? These are the kinds of conclusions and gaps that you may identify from the work. So that's that. I'll circle this around in an email that I'll send tomorrow to everyone um, about finding a gap. But this should give you a pretty good idea of uh, so, some stages and some description of what you should be doing when you want to find a gap. Um, but the second part is getting into the research questions. Um, and I'm going to spend maybe 10 quick minutes on this because um, I really want to get into the activity to help you apply some of the learnings that we've learned here. So the research question, we're going to talk about PICO, we're going to talk about FINER, and we're going to talk about some steps, right? And we're gonna share a couple of examples from my own work. So good research questions, there's four components of, it, and I'm not referring to PICO or FINER, right? Uh, the purpose of research questions is to improve the clarity of the problem that you are studying or that's being addressed in the study. Research question is a one statement summary of what you're really trying to do. So it has to be clear, has to be effective, has to be meaningful. It also sets the stage for other parts of the study, right? It becomes a foundation for, if it's a literature review, what search terms are you using, right? The search terms from the research question. Um, it also informs the design and execution of the study. Of course, your study design and your study methods should be aligned with your research question, right? Um, if they're not aligned, then there needs to be a little bit of work to further scope and really deepen, uh, really align the different elements of your study. Um, and it's, it's meant to also assess whether or not the study accomplished what it intended. And that's really the purpose of, uh, you know, if, if you ever read, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you've been in this situation, but I have in instances where I've done peer reviews where there's a research question at the very beginning and then the conclusions are very different. Just, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, but often they're so confusing that I can't, yeah, I can't remember them really well. 
But if your reaction after reading an article is that, wait, they didn't answer the research questions, then clearly the research question either wasn't good or maybe it was good and it just uh, went off of different pathways and they wrote an article that was just not coherent. Mm -hmm. Good articles need to be coherent and need to be aligned across the research question to the methods, to the analysis, to the discussion, to the conclusions. That's what a good article is. And it all starts with a good research question. So let's talk about some examples. So this is a bad example. Um, and I'll explain why. It may look like a good example to some of you, but I'll explain that. So is high dose brachytherapy as a boost to external beam radiotherapy better than external beam radiotherapy alone for prostate cancer? So this is work I did in 2014 at a cancer program, just to understand. And back then there was, um, uh, for some who may not be in the field, um, that there was a big, a big issue or gap to understand for uh, certain risks of uh, certain prostate cancers, um, what treatments are better, um, because there's a few modalities of treatment. There's you know, external beam, there's brachytherapy, there's just watchful waiting or active surveillance. There's also the surgery. Um, so there's a lot of like talk about what treatments are better, what are the benefits, et cetera. Um, and a lot of people are going into databases and trying to figure out wh whether, <laughs> whether or not uh, a particular treatment or particular modalities are good. Um, but this is a bad research question for, uh, okay, well, sorry. <laughs> Um, this is a bad research question. Oops. Yeah, this is a bad research question um, because it's unclear. And it's unclear uh, who the patients are. Um, it's unclear about the relevance, right? It's unclear about the setting. Um, now I'll show you, and of course it's unclear about other things, but what it should be is something like this. For patients with high risk and clinically localized prostate cancer, very specified population, at the Windsor Regional Cancer Program, very specific setting, does external beam radiotherapy with the boost of high dose brachytherapy provide a superior relapse free survival compared to external beam radiotherapy alone? So, also the outcome is very clear. How can I tell if a research question is good? <laughs> how can I tell that the first one was bad and how can I tell the second one is good? It's through this framework, the PICO. You have seen this, right? Uh, the PICO is essentially the four main components to it is the PICO. And there can be additional two components that you can use depending upon your research study, right? So population intervention comparison outcome are necessary for any PICO use. But in some cases, time is also important. So if you were doing a like, study on the COVID-19 pandemic, that would have been important. And study can be important as well. So how do I know the first one is bad? Um, well, first one, uh, the population is a little bit unclear. Patients with prostate cancer. The intervention is clear. You know, high dose brachytherapy as a boost to external beam radiotherapy. Comparison is clear to external beam radiotherapy alone. I mean, but the outcome is also unclear. Relapse, free survival, or sorry, better, right? Um, external be what, what is better? What does better mean? We need a specific outcome. That's why this question is really bad because it's very ambiguous. For the good question, all the PICO components are very clear, right? High risk and clinically localized prostate cancer. The intervention and comparison are clear, but they were clear for the bad one as well. And the outcome is clear. Relapse-free survival. And of course, relapse-free survival has this definition and all that, all that stuff. So so really, PICO, point of this exercise to show is PICO really helps you to identify the elements of a research question, uh, elements of a good research question. So if you make a research question, always go back to PICO and ensure that you have those questions, you have those elements, and they're clear to you. But PICO, in my opinion, helps, but there's also the broader implications of each, uh, each study. Um, and PICO doesn't help you get to get at this broader implication. And that's why we sort of in teaching talk about the final framework. And this may be less familiar to some of you, but this is really about looking at the more practical as well as the, 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 the broader implications of a particular study. So the first is feasible. You know, is the study defined by the research question and the PICO framework feasible? 
how many people are included, what expertise do you need, what's the cost, what's the scope? Is it interesting, right? Is it interesting to the researchers? Is it interesting to other researchers working in this area? Is it novel? Is, is it an original research question? Um, and is it ethical? And this is usually done, done through an RMB approval. Um, and is it relevant? Does it actually contribute to science, clinical practice, policy, and or research? So for going back to that example of the good question, it is feasible, it is interesting. And I told you about the context of at that time, there was uncertainty about which modalities are better. It is novel too, because yeah, at the time, a lot of uh, oncologists and radiation oncologists were talking about this. Um, it was ethical. We used retrospective, retrospective, uh, retrospective database um, analysis. Um, and it's relevant, but that depends on who. It was relevant to the practitioners in the area. It was relevant to hospital administrators. It was relevant to clinical guideline developers, which this study part of was part of multiple other studies that informed the, the recommendation that for lower risk prostate cancer, watchful waiting has similar outcomes. I think it's changed since then, but that was uh, an implication of, of that on the clinical guideline at that time. Um, but another example, right, a random example for the question, on average, how do people eat their suppers in a Canadian urban city? Is it feasible? Not really, because how many people are you going to survey, right? Thousands, 10,000, 10, 100,000? Not very feasible. Interesting, it might be. It might be interesting to some people, not interesting to me. Um, is it novel? Uh, not really. Who wants to know about how people eat? How do people eat their suppers? Um, is it ethical? I think it really depends on the RAB. Is it relevant? Again, not really. Um, why do we want to do research on how people eat suppers? Like, what's the reason behind it, right? Is it that supper, eating suppers provide better health gains? I, mean, I, I don't think there's any research. I may be wrong. But what's the reason for actually doing this? I don't see it. Uh, and therefore, the finer, uh, the finer model doesn't really fit well. It helps you to identify whether the research question is, is really worth pursuing. As you can see, both of these frameworks go hand in hand. PICO really helps you to hone in on the elements of a good, clear research question. FINER, on the other hand, helps you to understand whether that research question is worth pursuing. That's why oftentimes um, in, in most circles, PICO is very much focused on. People don't focus on FINER or they focus on in the back of their head very superficially. But my recommendation, and this is what I do in my work, is focus on both of them sequentially. Make a good research questions first that is clear using PICO and then assess it against the finer criteria to fully understand whether it's feasible, interesting, novel, ethical, and relevant. Um, and maybe it might be in for some of these criteria, right? But it helps you to understand these dimensions of a research project. And even if uh, the conclusion is that, yeah, it, 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 it is interesting and novel and relevant, it will still help you deepen your understanding of the research question and help you build better, effective, more meaningful research projects. And that's the purpose of this, is you need to know your stuff and you need to develop effective, meaningful projects and FINER will help you to get to that. I think I just said this, <laughs> said this all in the previous one, but just specific steps um, when it comes to this. Um, so identify a research area, list the elements of a PICO for question framing, specify the elements, write the question in interior format, write the research in their interior format. That's just basically a fancy way of saying write a research question. Um, uh, Cross-check it uh, with whether or not the PICO elements are met and then cross-check it with fine and to understand whether the research question should be pursued. Um, okay, I think what we're going to do is we're going to skip this. Um, this was just an activity individually. We're going to skip this because we have one activity that I want you to do individually just to help you further. Um, and of course, I'll, I I can send this activity. Um, if you find it helpful, I can send it over email. But the activity is just to take this research question and identify the people elements. So I can identify that. But what we'll do is we'll skip it. Uh, I will focus on this activity on creating research questions. So just a quick few notes, you'll work individually because we have about five students here. Um, 
so uh, a lot of this I have mentioned and the reason why the activity, the way it's created is to scaffold everything that I've shared so far, right? So for example, in the find the gap uh, uh, resource that we have, we talked about pick a discipline, pick a specific issues, things like that. So that's the first step. At working individually, pick the discipline that you're working in or that is interesting to you or a discipline that you want to be working in, right? For example, I gave public health. Narrow the discipline to a specific topic or issues based on your readings, your experience. Um, vaccine hesitancy is a big issue, like I mentioned earlier. Identify for the purposes of this, I know in the resource I said three reviews, but for purposes of this, identify one to two reviews because I don't want you to be spending too much time. Um, once you've identified those reviews using Google Scholar, so remember I said, you know, vaccine hesitancy review in Google Scholar, sit and then click since 2020. Read their abstract very quickly. That should take you maybe 30, 45 seconds. Understand the objective, the context, understand the findings, discussion, just the abstract. And then based on that, think of like what questions uh, is this, uh, what questions is this review answering and what question isn't it answering based on the abstract? Um, and you may come up with several questions based on your practice and your experience. Narrow those research questions into top three. You may not have more than that, but maybe one or two research questions based on the article. And what we'll do is we'll present it to a larger group and we'll just have sort of a feedback sharing, sharing session. So does this make sense? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give everyone, you know, we're almost about time. I'm going to give everyone about 12 minutes to get a review, read the review, and develop a couple of research questions. Um, and if you need any help, just feel free to message me and I will be here. So we'll be back at 1120. maybe as an extra motivation if there's really good research questions that are like are interesting to me um shazim and i and maybe others might be willing to work with you to actually develop that into a full-fledged publication just as a motivation uh the purposes of this is to really help you own in our research questions but i'm always open to really interesting studies
about five minutes left, and then we'll come to back together to hear some of these amazing research questions. Thanks.
Okay, let's come back. Who is ready to share their research question? And um, you can sh share it out loud, but also please, uh, when you share it out loud, uh, make sure to just put it in the chat so we can also read it. Anyone want to share? Rabia shared the research question to me. Um, if it's okay, Rabia, I'm just going to uh, share it to everyone so everyone can participate. So the relationship in young individuals, age group 30 to 40, presenting with chest pain and having benign early repolarization in the ECG with diabetes. Thoughts on the research question? Thank you for sharing, Rabia. What do you think? What do you think, Shani? Um, yeah, Assalamualaikum, everyone. Yeah, for our first attempt, I think she has covered um, some of the criteria, um, uh, but like it's not specific enough, and uh, there are some things missing. Um, we could discuss that in greater detail as well. What do you think? Yeah, well, um, just maybe just give a couple examples of what what you would add or change to make it more specific. Okay, so um, basically chest pain and having benign, presenting with chest pain and having benign early repolarizations uh, in the ECG with diabetes. Um, it's uh, quite, I think it's quite broad. I would uh, narrow it down into what specifically are you, what's, what specific relationship are you looking at, right? So um, is it like, what's the outcome that you're specifically targeting? Uh, the re relationship is a very vague term, so the outcome is it hasn't been defined really well here. Um, young individuals, you've defined it yourself, right? And um, it hasn't really talked about, is there a specific gender? What, what's the type of risk of the patient? Is there any other comorbidity? Just like specifying it more, the population would make it better. Um, intervention, I can't really see, is there any intervention here? Our uh, relationship is kind of broad in that sense. Um, um, comparison outcome. Yeah, that's pretty much my feedback for that. It is a really good first attempt, though. I, I think we could refine it further. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Rabia, my recommendation very quickly is um, map out, like I did, um, all the elements of this research question across PICO first. Um, I think the outcome is a little bit unclear. If I map it out in my head, the outcome is is unclear and could be could be clarified. Um, and um, uh, the population the population is clear. The intervention is unclear, kind of right. But if you map it out, you'll see where the clarity needs where there needs to be a bit more clarity. Um, and you'll help to address some of Shazim's questions as well as the recommendations. Any other questions? Okay, at least I one. What effect does 
different demographics have on the development of antimicrobial resistance of different classes of drugs? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question. Any thoughts on, on the question? What is, what it's done well, maybe suggestions for improvement, if any. Um, may I, if I could suggest something, I, I I would think, is it okay if it's okay with Ali, if all the other participants, they uh, like map out PICO for this research question, just like two minutes, quickly just look over the research question, and one by one, as Umar said for the previous question, write down what you guys think is the population intervention and so on. Uh, how does that sound, Umar? Yeah, that's fine. We can spend two minutes very quickly, guys. Very quickly. You can, uh, guys, you can share it in the chat, like P-I-C-O, like just the, like Omar has done in the slide previously. Why don't I go back to Pico? Yeah. It's my idea. Okay. Um, if there's anyone that has done their PICO application to the research question, feel free to share in the chat um, and feel free to talk about it. We'd love to hear your research questions. Okay, <clears throat> I mean, we're almost at time. So feel free to add any questions if you want. What I will do, Shazim, um, is um, I think all of you have my email, presidentandmethodologist.org. Um, I believe there's a second one, so we'll, we'll quickly talk about it. Um, but feel free to you know, uh, apply the PICO framework to your question and send it to me in that email. I'll CC Shazim and we'll, uh, we'll look through it. Um, and we'll offer any comments. In that email, if you want, put in the research question, but also provide us with the people application. So what's the, well, so P, what's the population right uh, intervention comparison? We kind of like this in a list format. So research question and PICO, 
And then we'll take a look and we'll offer any feedback or suggestions. How does that sound? So uh, I'll put my uh, email right here, but you should have it in your email as well because that's where you receive your invitation. Please send it to us and we'll get back to you in like a week. Um, but just looking at some of the questions here, Robbie also sent, or Alina also sent one. So I'll put one. Um, Ali said population would be demographics. Interaction would uh, be to perform cultures of their specimens. Comparison would be antibiotic classes. And the outcome, yeah. That comes a question. The other thing I would say is population could be more specific. Which demographics are you referring to? Um, in um, in North America and in Europe, as you know, there's been a lot of exodus of people from Asia and Africa. So North America and Europe are becoming very, very diverse. So we're a lot of conversation about demographics. Uh, what we usually, what the terms we usually use now are called social identity characteristics, right? Mm -hmm. Social identity characteristics mean age, race, ethnicity, background, gender, um, but which one are you referring to? Are you referring to all of them? There's so many of them. Or do you want, for example, if I'm here, um, do I want to know about, uh, you know, testing of black people, Chinese people, Pakistani people, right? White people, like, is it specific groups or all the groups? That could be a bit more specific, uh, especially because if you're just referring to all demographics, and it's not really feasible because there's a lot of people out there. Um, so that could be specific too. And of course the outcome, what are you really interested in? What do you want to measure? Is there a specific outcome that has been measured in similar studies um, like this? Um, you can easily use that and input it into your PICO. And then in individuals at high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, does following an antioxidant rich diet compared to a standard diet reduce the incidence of Alzheimer's disease? This is from Alina. I think this is a really good question. What do you think, Shazim? I agree. Yeah. That was really well done. Yeah. And for Ali, I think your outcome might be antimicrobial resistance. Um, for that, um, I would suggest, like, uh, generally speaking, it would be better if you specify the type of antimicrobial that you've done later on, right? So in the comparison. Uh, you said it would be between antibiotics, but antimicrobial is quite um it's quite broad. It includes antivirals, antifungals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, really, really good attempt. And I think that's uh you've done a great job as well. Yeah. Amazing. Um so next week we have another one. We're talking about research design and methodology. Um, and please give us feedback. Thank you so much for attending. We hope that this was helpful to you. Um, feel free to give us feedback and we'll take a look at the feedback and we may modify, uh, we may modify the workshops that are upcoming. Um, but that's all it for us. Um, take care and we'll see you next Monday.